Anyway, I'm Jim Cluvier. I'm here today because I'm one of the longest standing members of the current Rescue Council to give you a sort of historical overview and an impression of rescue and what we do. I will advertise rescue regularly, but it, I mean, it is all about rescue, but we're still here. That is why the answer to the question is hopefully no. I was amused actually to note trawling through old copies of Rescue News for today that in 1996, our annual open meeting was entitled Archaeology Today, Public Service or Secret Society? Question mark. And it wasn't me that used the title then. Um, the first part of the talk, which predates even my main active involvement, draws on two main sources, the Pelican Rescue Archaeology book by Philip Ratz in 1974, and Rescue's updating of this 40 years later on in Rescue Archaeology Foundations for the Future. This is, of course, an advert. That book is very good. I have nothing to do with promote, producing it. it it's, it's excellent. It's on sale downstairs on the rescue table. <coughs> Should be read by all people interested in how it works, what archaeology is about, what the fuck are we doing, what are people involved in. <laughs> During the 1950s and 60s, the post-war e economic development boom hugely damaged the historic environment, both above and below ground, usually with minimal recording, although occasional high-profile events, such as the discovery of the Temple of Mithras, which you can see on the screen, attracted a huge public response. And this is when the concept of rescue archaeology was really established. Um, at the time, mostly small-scale grants were made by the Inspectorate of Ancient Monuments, which was at that time within government, for various sites to be excavated prior to being destroyed, either by development or indeed by agriculture. The potential of urban archaeology was illustrated by the work of Martin Biddle in Winchester between 1961 and 1971, where he set out to study the development of the town from the Iron Age onwards, on a mixture of threatened and non-threatened sites under the auspices of the Winchester Excavation Committee, and they established a full-time Winchester Research Unit in 1968. Another notable rescue archaeology project in the late 1960s was led by Margaret and Tom Jones at Mucking in advance of gravel quarrying. This one was noted for its Spartan working conditions. A conference in Bristol produced the quotes on the screen and led Phil Barker to write a paper entitled Not Waving, Just Drowning, which was a terrible misquote, <laughs> which he circulated amongst other active field workers for comment. And this led to the key group of active archaeologists involved in the Foundation of Rescue, whose names, I hope you can read the screen, good, um, convening a series of meetings to discuss ways forward, culminating in January 1971 with a very large open meeting in London at Senate House. The key proposals at the meeting were firstly to work towards the setting up of a state antiquity service with some 20 regional centres, and secondly to set up rescue as a campaigning mass membership body to get things moving. The formal organisation and committee, council and patrons were established the following year. And looking at the names, it's remarkable who the patrons included. This is a nice list of non-archaeologist cultural figures. Um, it's clear that the archaeological activists of the day were on the committee. So nowadays, many of those names might seem quite establishment because we know how their careers went on for many years after 1970s, um, and of course there was a council of the establishment figures which was largely there as a sort of background, this is a respectable organisation and we've drummed you into joining in. <coughs> so that's as far as I can read it, it's hard to tell and I was not involved. Um, Slightly appalling, it was only one woman on the rescue committee in 1972, but things have changed since then. A key strategy was to raise the public profile of rescue archaeology, and we can see that with this piece in the Observer, they were 
doing something towards that. Uh, the example of chaos in Dover was to demonstrate that what happens if you ignore the archaeology is that you get very bad publicity locally. The result of all this was indeed an acceleration of central government funding and an increasing formalization of permanent local organizations such as the county-based units which were loosely linked to local government structures. By 1974, Rescue and the CBA were still arguing for a national archaeological service operating through regional offices within which the local units could continue. But they were opposed by many who saw this as a threat to the new units. Even in the late 1980s, I remember people saying about Rescue that the support for a national service was a big mistake. Such people were, of course, usually in positions of power locally. But as a long-term county council employee, I have to agree that some aspects of the job do indeed fit best into local government structures. From the start, Rescue was not just about getting a national system for rescue excavation, but was looking at the complete process. This very early edition of Rescue News, with its particularly dated T-shirt advert, we can do much better today, and the T-shirts are indeed available downstairs, looking not unlike this, but different. <laughs> um, but what this edition on the left was actually doing was announcing the first version of our most republished book, which is First Aid for Fines. Young Rescue was also started in the mid-1970s, before later moving and becoming the Young Archaeologists Club. Inevitably, of course, it was Kate Pretty who initiated by Young Rescue. And I presume none of the rest of them knew anything about children. And the first current archaeology awards were a joint effort with Rescue in 1977. This is a kind of theme. We kind of started things or said things and then, then they got taken over in some way or another. By the t Oops. During the 1980s, Rescue argued that rescue archaeology should be part of the responsibilities of the newly created English heritage in law rather than just maybe, and also pointed out that funding from them, from English heritage, although much higher than at the start of the 70s, was still not addressing all the threats. Indeed, there was a heavy dependence on the Manpower Services Commission, which I'm glad to see you're talking about later, so I won't divert into that one, um, except to say that, as ever, archaeology was relying on the creative use of a system that is definitely not designed for purpose. It was actually supposed to be reducing unemployment. By the time of the Rescue Archaeology What's Next conference in 1986, it was indeed apparent that things needed to change again. We had an archaeological profession, but it was a dire shortfall in central government funds, only counterbalanced by the MSC, a steady growth in local authority investment and jobs, and very occasional support from developers. Rescue was heavily involved in protesting about key sites in 1989, in particular the Queen's Hotel in York and the Rose in London. I have no doubt I don't need to tell you anything about. But basically, what was clear was that voluntary developer funding could prove absolutely disastrous. And these high-profile problems led, of course, in 1991 to PPG 16. And it's interesting looking back, the PPG 16, as it emerged, was much more effective than the initial drafts of that document. There was a lot of input from a large number of archaeological bodies, including rescue, into that. We had already identified a serious problem around the PPG 16 route after living through a decade of privatisation and political support for the free market. So in 1990, we held a conference on competitive tendering in archaeology. I think this remains one of the major issues in archaeology, but opinions still vary hugely as to how we should constrain market forces for the public good. From the late 1970s, Rescue carried out surveys of the profession to discover just how many people were employed as archaeologists and how much money was coming in from the various different sources. 
These are taken over by much better resourced organisations such as EFA profiling the profession in the mid-90s. But the existing research results are key sources for our history of organisational aspects. Alongside the big debates, rescue takes on individual sites. The one that won't go away is Stonehenge, but there have been plenty of other occasions when we have raised concerns about threats or damage to archaeological sites, sometimes publicly, sometimes quietly, and sometimes by advising local individuals or groups how to take something forward. This was actually the one that brought me into rescue, which is an odd one. Because I was working in Suffolk, I was well aware in about 1983 that the Society of Antiquaries and the British Museum were planning to use a financial windfall to fund new research at Sutton Hoo. But no one else actually publicly debated whether this was the right choice of site for this investment. And Rescue did run quite a big spread on what was planned and gave a voice to anybody who thought that perhaps it was not the most obvious research project to choose. I may have been wrong to oppose it. In fact, it would have done my career no good at all. <laughs> From 2000 onwards, campaigning has tended to be dominated by the impacts of cuts in the public sector, both on museums and local authority advice services. Linked to this is the archive storage issue, which was largely ignored by far too many people until recently. We produced an online help document, Fighting Back, that offers advice for those fighting cuts to their local heritage services, and we wrote many letters of support with varying outcomes. Recently, the Brexit process threw up issues around environmental protection, the basis of archaeology and planning, and there was a magnificent response to our open letter to Parliament on this. We followed up by targeting our concerns onto individual MPs and members of the House of Lords and so we did contribute our tiny bit to the successful Lord's Amendment that forced government to bring forward specific environmental legislation as part of the awful process. So what are today's issues and can rescue still contribute something different to the various other national heritage bodies? I've just jotted quickly some possible current and ongoing issues. You may well disagree with them. I hope you take the points about why rescue at the bottom most. Come and talk to us. Consider joining. Perhaps you'd even like to join council for some input. Um, not because it will advance your personal career, though it might, but because we will always fight for what is best for the archaeology. I'm ending with a slide to credit some of the many people who have contributed substantially to rescue since the 1980s. You may find some of the names quite surprising. Um, the two ex-chairs pictured also lost their day jobs while in post with rescue, but luckily that pattern was stopped. Personally, I took the precaution of retiring before I became chair. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>